Okay. But well, I went amazing. last week. Well, I went last week to figure out um, where it was and to and to um, share it with you, but it automatically got put on Aloha I Need Now Living. No, I I I, I did that manually. Oh, did you? Downloaded. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then this well, time, so um, that's... I, I guess it had it could some because you have to put like three codes in and and it can always like have a mistake or something or something can be i think it's better to just go with Streamyard and zoom and live stream from zoom to or from Streamyard to both rumble and youtube yeah we'll, we'll do that for next time then um so yeah. this time we're, we're recording so we want to uh begin and i'll allow myself to present this 70th Aini Living Conversation. I am with Blue Heron Woman. I am Julian Gattari. And um, this is the second part of the, base, the ontogenic basis of view. Um, it's kind of the story of the embryo and how that speaks about our just about everything in us, our destiny, our the way we we should understand life. And so the first session, we kind of covered things that are very important. And I think that I, I want to mention that um, it's kind of we touch on something that is the dogmas of science, right? The, the dogmas of of the sign of the science of science as a world view, not as science as science, right? Right. The scientific worldview. So there's a lot of things that we're told about genetics and about so many things that are simply incorrect. You, you use the words incorrect and imprecise. I like to use plainly say wrong. <laughs> They're just wrong. And um, there's some truth in them, but incorrect and precise. Um, so that's kind of what we covered on the first session where you, you spoke about the, the, the role of, of the cells and genetics and, and how genes are more of a, have a role of- um, Stability. Of, um, Stabil stability, they're the stability factor. They're not the motives of development. Okay, they're so- DNA genes. Yeah. So yeah, you, so you said even better now. Um, so we're gonna continue on this conversation and let's see what you have prepared for us. Ingrid. Well, so there's three periods in our ontogeny as an embryo fetus. And these are, uh, number one is the period of early development of the whole conceptus, which is one to three weeks after fertilization. And then there's the period of embryonic development within the conceptus. So the, the conceptus is the fertilized ovum, right? The embryo develops in the conceptus. So I think that's very important for us to understand. The embryo develops in the conceptus. It's not. <laughs> it's not the conceptus inside. itself. It develops inside the conceptus. Yeah. Okay. And that's four to eight weeks, and then there's a period of fetal development, which is then eight weeks to birth. So we're going to go into the very in the early and embryonic periods because they're very important as they demonstrate the precise, the precision of developmental movements, even in the first few days after fertilization. These movements are performances of work by the conceptus. And again, we're going to keep emphasizing that the conceptus is always a whole. It's not a separate entity or any, it's not just a cell, it's a conceptus. Mm -hmm. So one sperm only penetrates the ovum's tough black calyx capsule known as the zona pellicuda. Mm -hmm. And contact of the male and female germ cells results in the membranous folds at the surface of the ovum that cause reactive changes in the zona 
pellicuda to prevent any more sperm cells from entering. So the ovum itself allows only one sperm shell to enter. Fertilization is completed when the two nuclear masses, the ovum and sperm, fuse and reestablish the standard diploid number of chromosomes. So the fertilized ovum is called a conceptus, and a human ovum is only about 1.5. 0.15, not one. It's only about 0.15 millimeters in diameter. It looks very much like a tiny drop of water. So for the first three days after fertilization, the conceptus lives in the fallopian tube, still enclosed in its zona pellicuda, which breaks down at about three to four days. Okay. After 40 to 50 hours after uh, fertilization, the conceptus becomes two cells. It's two daughter cells and a tiny volume of intercellular fluid. These changes signify a rearrangement at the molecular level and re represent the start of intercellular circulation at 40 to 50 hours after fertilization. So remember what we said last week, there's never a point when the conceptus is not a living being already. Yeah. After the third day, the number of daughter cells or blastomeres in, have increased so rapidly by, that by day four, there's more than 100 daughter cells or blastomeres. So inside this tiny little drop of water, because it hasn't grown any, is 100 cells. Okay. And at this point, it's, there's no demonstrable increase in the size of the conceptus. And other than small sites where intercellular fluid accumulates, the newly formed cells do not separate from each other. They remain enclosed in the zona pellicuda, clinging to each other through the reciprocal exchange, the INI, exchange of materials. So there is never a point in our lives when our cells are not in INI. This metabolic Exchange is a consequence of the chemical and structural disparity of the daughter cells, and this metabolic exchange enables the cells to retain their various forms. This is an important forming function of the first cells. So there's a hundred little daughter cells, a hundred blastomeres in this tiny droplet of water called the conceptus, and they each have their specific form. They're not which is very interesting to me. So through the metabolic reciprocity, the metabolic INI, there's a gradual increase in the quantity of me metabolic byproducts that accompanies this increase in cell number, uh, number. These byproducts pool together and form the first intercellular substance. This pooling leads to the formation of the one-chambered conceptus and the eccentric location of the intercellular material is probably due to lack of symmetry in the timing of the blastomere formation. So there's no symmetry, it's not equal. So pure symmetry in biology is virtually impossible. And the increasing asymmetry signifies a polarization of the conceptus. Let's say that again. The increasing asymmetry signifies a polarization of the conceptus. So when we go back to natural law and people tell you that we can transcend polarity, that's bullshit because we wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be an adult. You wouldn't be a human without polarity. Right. Yeah, so that's, that transcend, transcend that's, that's, people trying to adapt whatever woke uh, narrative <laughs> into the- well, it's, duel it's duality that can be transcendent, which is it's right it's a, versus wrong, good versus bad, evil versus good, right? That's a duality we create in ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> Stuff like that. Not so quite. now the, the one chambered conceptus polarizes and it has an assimilation pole and a dissimilation pole, positive and negative. Polarity cannot be transcendent because you would not become you if there were no poles, if there were no negative and positive. Right. Yeah, you would wonder that the, maybe there couldn't be any energy in the universe if there weren't polarities. Exactly. Nothing. Right. 
There has to be a positive and negative yeah. for energy to flow. There has to be a giver and a receiver, a receiver and a giver. That's what polarity is. Yeah. So at the dissimilation pole, fluid is exuded from the cells that are decreasing in size. With increasing fluid in the lumen of the blastocyst, the small cells become flatter. And these are the first squamous cells. And it's squamous cells line our gut, line our mouths, line right, line our eyes, so line our nasal mucosa. That's all squamous cells. So these already start in the first week. From this, we conclude that the fluid in the in the uh, in the uh, conceptus possesses an osmotic pressure, which causes the, the poles to, to split, right? So at the assimilation pole, the cells remain larger, constituting what is called the blastodisc or inner cell mass. And these cells are reabsorbing the fluid from the lumen that, that is coming out of the cells that are squishing flat into squamous cells. So lots, lots and there is hard of words, lots of new words for me. So it's yeah, but that's how I'm trying. I'm working. I'm taking it slow. It, so it, it, um, <laughs> that's okay. I like it. There's so at this point, there's no uh, very little to no absorption of nutrients from outside the blastocyst. So this this blastocyst of a hundred cells in the conceptus is is feeding itself. It's not even attached to the mother's uterine wall at this point. It's still in the, well, at day four, we'll, we'll get there. Um, Somehow so this, this uh -huh. it's autonomous to, for a while. It is, yeah, it is, absolutely. Autonomous unity is what Umberto Matarana and Francisco Varela talk about in their autopoiesis. So, um, so there's hardly any cells absorption of nutrients from the outside. So this strongly suggests that the changes that are taking place are more in the nature of intermixing than new formations. So this signifies a differentiation into opposites and is also a characteristic of later phases of development. So we haven't grown in size, but we've developed a positive and negative pole and opposites. So on about the fourth day, the conceptus has moved out of the fallopian tube and is now situated with its thickly walled assimilation pole adjacent to the lining of the uterus. So it hasn't implanted in the uterus yet. It's still just adjacent. Okay. Up to this time, the blastocyst or conceptus with its hundred cells and it has remained as small as the original ovum. Its consistency is almost liquid. And around this time, the zona pellicula, pellicula ruptures and the blastocyst hatches. This rupture is also caused by pulsations in the blastocyst. So, they're ascertaining that in that little tiny drop of water, the conceptus, there's already energy pulsing and that helps rupture the zona pellicuda. Now, the blastocyst can attach itself to the wall of the uterus at its assimilation pole. So the conceptus actually sucks its way into the uterine mucosa, the mucosa, the uterine lining. It sucks its way in like a squid. <laughs> As the conceptus orients itself and nestles into the uterine surface at its assimilation pole, it now comes into direct contact with the met metabolic fields of the mother of the maternal tissues. So now at the beginning of the second week, the uh, conceptus has almost fully implanted itself below the surface of the mucosa. So it sucked its way all the way into the mucosa. It's now almost all the way in. It didn't just implant, it just sucked itself in. 
So in the biodynamic fields of the conceptus, there's a pushing layer and a pulling layer. That's the poles, right? There's got to be a, a rising, a pushing, and a pulling. A pushing. It's how energy, it's how electricity works. So again, we can't transcend polarity. Wherever cells lie close together, extend it perpendicular to free surface, they exert a mutual reciprocal pressure in a lateral direction, a sideways direction. So where they lay perpendicular, they're pushing, pushing apart with recipro reciprocal pressure. So um, at two weeks, we're in a two-chambered conceptus, and now the third week brings us a three-chambered conceptus. In one of the layers of tissues, there is a tension that pulls the conceptus in a circular and radial directions as the conceptus enlarges. So at this point, it's looking kind of like the uh, golden spiral. Um, this tension causes the cells to become flattened, so they lose some of their intercellular fluid, and this fluid collects in the spaces between where the cells have gotten flattened and stuff. And so now the tissue is honeycombed. So kind of like the picture I sent you of the interior of a goat's, that's what it reminds me of, the, the interior of a goat's, one of the pockets of a goat's rumen, where it's, it's, right, it's spiraled and it's honeycombed at the same time. So at this point, the embryo is broad and blunt at one end and narrow and pointed at the other. But at no stage is this endocyst disc flat. It always exhibits high and low reliefs. The blunt end already indicates the head region of the body, and the pointed end is the inferior part of the trunk. The predominance of the brain, which is typical for humans, is already apparent at the 14th day of development. The broadness of the head region of the body is a sign that growth at the free end occurs more rapidly against the lower growth resistance. So in the head region, we now have an area of high relief that's called the expansion dome. And in opposition to this, a depression occurs in the trunk region that is called an impansion pit. So now we have the axial process or spine spinal cord, spine, not just the cord, the whole spine developing between the expansion dome and the impansion pit. Wow. And the axial process or spine develops, elongates because the expansion dome keeps rolling over and contri contributing new cells to the base. Okay. So there's a constant moving going on. It's dynamic. That's what dynamic means. It's a constant so when you sit in dynamic stillness, you're not, your body may be still, but you're sensing the, the interior constant movement. There's, right, even in dynamic equilibrium, there's constant movement. That's why I can say a, a, a organism in equilibrium is dead, but an organism in dynamic equilibrium is very much alive because there's constant movement. Okay. So at the beginning of the fourth week, the embryo is now 1.8 millimeters long. The head, neck, and trunk regions can be distinguished. And we can say now that the development of the heart takes place to meet the vascular requirements of the young brain. So that the heart isn't developing because we need a heart to live. It's developing because the development of the brain needs it. <laughs> The heart is already starting to beat at the start of the fourth week. And as the heart is growing to meet the vascular requirements of the brain, so the liver is forming to assist the heart, acting as kind of a pre-filter for fluids moving to the heart, which is interesting that in, in the uh, five elements and in, in, uh, ancient Chinese medicine, we talk about the, the uh, liver being the, uh, the heart being the emperor and the liver is the assistant to the emperor. So I thought that was pretty interesting that the liver forms to assist the heart. 
The organs of the body are not static, they are fields of metabolism, and these fields are constituted and sustained by living cells. The topogenesis or positional development of a group of cells is an important prerequisite for their tectogenesis or structural differentiation. For any ensemble of cells, positional development determines the development of their form, and this in turn, develop, turn determines their structural development. So the position dictates the development of their form, and the development of their form dictates their structural form, the, their structural development. So positional topogenesis, form morphogenesis, and structural tectogenesis go hand in hand, and it is only through INI reciprocity that they bring about development in general. So at the submicroscopic level, these process, there's movements of these processes that are called metabolic movements. And these metabolic movements that go on in the cells or the ensembles of cells have not only chemical significance, they also always display accompanying physical and spatial or morphological characteristic. So movements in a metabolic field are a fundamental characteristic of the process of development. The movements of particles in these fields always occur against resistance on their part, on the part of their surrounding, and so they represent work in a biophysical sense. This work, when expanded over a particular period of time, represents, uh, in turn, signifies a particular biophysical power, which represents an embryonic performance or achievement. So this means that the development of a human being from the earliest stages onward can be interpreted in dynamic and biological sense as a performance specific to the individual. All cells are always linked kinetically to one another through movement of materials. The cells absorb nutrients through the honeycomb that was created and from neighboring cells. And by means of this material uptake or receiving, they exert a re reciprocal attraction to each other. On the other hand, they also exert a mutual repulsion through the release of metabolic byproducts. This changing interplay between receiving and giving attraction and repulsion is a precondition for cells to order themselves in particular arrangements and maintain certain forms. So at no point is there not any ever happening in our body. <laughs> so even in the earliest stages of development, we find two characteristically different tissues in the embryo and the uh, conceptus. Mm -hmm. it, it's called limiting tissue and inner tissue. So the limiting tissue is the boundary between fluid on one side and inner tissue on the other. Limiting tissue is typically called epithelium and many derivatives of inner tissue are identified as connective tissue. Mm -hmm. A morphological characteristic of all limiting tissue is a formation of a layer of closely packed cells with very narrow intercellular clefts. Limiting tissues reg regularly consist of many cells with very little intercellular substance because they're packed together so tightly. So inner tissue, on the other hand, is surrounded on all sides by limiting tissue, and so it's landlocked. So here, catabolites become congested as a distinct intercellular material or ground substance that causes that, gives rise to the fashion. So this is a character, characteristic feature of all inner tissues. There are thick and thin types of limiting tissue, and we encounter thick limiting tissue in places where the surface growth of the tissue is impeded, and thin where surface growth is facilitated. So for example, 
Even in a 20 millimeter long embryo, the surface growth of the epidermis of the hand plate is hindered during formation of the palm. So this is where thick tissue develops, right? Even in a 20 centimeter long embryo, this thick tissue is developing here. Surface growth is impeded so that it gives us the, and so this, this side is thin tissue, this side is thick tissue. So even in a 20 millimeter uh, embryo, this is happening. This calloused epithelial thickening is a characteristic of the ability for us to grip. And so it's already apparent during embryonic development. A region con containing both thick and thin limiting tissues is the epidermis of the embryo's head. Here we'll find that the epithelium over the rapidly growing brain is quite thin, whereas in the vicinity of the folds of the face, it's very thick. Because again, we need thick skin over our face. So where our skin is thick is where its growth was restricted in our embryonic state of being. In contrast to the thick epithelia, thin epithelia grow in such a way that they often remain single layered. So as a rule, the boundary membrane of cells in limiting tissue join the inner and outer surfaces of the layer by the shortest route possible. So the lateral or side boundaries of the cells are more or less perpendicular to their bases. And flat surfaces occur almost nowhere in the human body. This means that epithelial cells almost always have a wedge shape. So limiting tissues are also called wedge epithelia. Okay. And inner tissues arise in metabolic fields adjacent to all limiting tissue. In inner tissue, the cells move further and further away from one another so that a net-like or honeycomb arrangement is produced. Much water intracellular substance accumulates and loosens the cell ensemble, so loose inner Tissue is the result of tissue having become loosened. <laughs> no duh. <laughs> so there are eight types, eight, eight metabolic fields of development, eight types. And we're going to go into a few of them uh, tonight. So the first one is corrosion fields. There's two sheets of living cells packed firmly against each other. So the wall of one disintegrates and a perforation or a hole develops. Mm -hmm. So a corrosion field is a biodynamic metabolic field in which epithelial cells die away. And an example of this in the embryo is the developing mouth region. Also mm -hmm. in the aorta and the kidneys. The next one is a suction field. This is like pulling apart a bellows, causing a reduced pressure or suction within the bellows. And we can recognize this field in all our glands. But what, An example what's the, what's would be the field here. Uh, field. What, it's what the metabolic it? field of development. But what is that? It's how it, it's what causes the development. But that's kind of unknown, right? Yeah. Well, that's that's why he's saying it's not the DNA that causes this. It's the not, fields it's not, of development. Not, it's not material, it's not. It's physical. just a field. Yeah. Right, it's a bio, bio yeah. So this is it's amazing how he, he's, somebody is finally integrating the, the unseen as a like indispensable part of the creation of the scene. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That's why I wanted to present this because it's so yeah, that's important. Why, that's, and that's why this, I mean, if, if I want to share this in the shamanism group, and they'll be like, oh, that doesn't have to do anything with shamanism. It's like, hey, listen to this. It has everything to do with, <laughs> with everything. Yeah, I was just going to say, it has everything to do with shamanism. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the suction field that's like pulling apart bellows, um, an example of this is the formation of the glands of our lips. Did you know you have glands in your lips? I didn't. Um, yes. As the saliva lips, glands, saliva glands. Yeah. 
as the lips become thicker, so the epithelial epithelia of the outer and inner side of the lip moves away. So there's like a bellows in our lips, a suction field that's poof, pushing them apart to be filled with um, sprouts of mucosal epithelium grow in there and become salivary glands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of gives a whole new meaning to our lips, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah. There's suction, there were suction fields in there that far. <laughs> um, so wherever glands develop in our bodies, it's always possible to demonstrate the existence of suction fields to loosen the inner tissue to allow this to happen. So our that's liver, right. our lungs, they're all examples of large suction fields. That's why we would like to go on looking for some, some other glands to suck on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 so then there's densation fields. This is like holding a sieve containing a mix of solid and liquid. And as the liquid drips out, the solid particles sediment and aggregate. So densation fields are characterized by the loss of intercellular fluids and the resulting close packing of cells. Sensation fields arise in the deeper regions of the embryo's inner tissue. And you can say, how are there deeper regions when the embryo is only this long? <laughs> but there are. <laughs> so all skeletonization in the embryo arises from densation fields. So our skeleton, our bones arise from densation fields. Densation so for example, in the deep as in getting denser? Yeah. Okay. That's precisely what, because it's as the fluid drips out, the cells pack together in sediment, right? It's, this field is like a sieve with water dripping out of it, okay. keeping the solids in. So for, for example, in the formation of the arm, the cells deeper become positioned closer to each other as the water moves out. So this densation field is where the skeleton of the arm arises, and this zone is developed, determined phenogenetically by the skin. <laughs> that still just kind of blows my mind. So where oh, your humerus is, is it, where your humerus is, is developed phenogenetically by your skin, where your radius amazing. and ulna, it mm -hmm. is, isn't it? branch out from the skeleton somehow but it's the other way around we the, this the skin is what creates the insider yeah it's kind of <laughs> so the skin foundation of an arm will upper arm will always lead to a humerus and the skin foundation of the forearm will always lead to a radius and ulna a hand skeleton is never found in the arm despite the fact that the genetic disposition of all itself in the form of their DNA is the same. So here again, we're gonna say, DNA are not the motors of development because the DNA is the same in the, in the uh, cells of the hand development as it is in the humor. So why, why do we not have a hand in our humors? Because it's laid down by the skin. It's determined by the skin. Mm -hmm. No, not the DNA, the fields, the fields, the fields, <laughs> the fields, <laughs> it's determined by the fields, <laughs> the metabolic fields, the invisible force. Wow. The differentiation of the densation fields also leads to the formation of our cartilage, our tendons, and our muscles. Wherever the biomechanical conditions in a metabolic field cause the cells, the tissue to lose its intercellular fluids so that the cells become consolidated, then we have a strengthening of the tissue. The, the genesis of a densation field or the beginning of a densation field in the interior of inner tissue is a developmental process that is preceded by differentiations taking place further to the outsides on the skin. So it's the differentiation at the skin level that causes the, <laughs> the sensation field that makes our bones. 
Okay. <laughs> so then there's contusion fields. And this would be like pushing together two springy lattices. The whole lattice narrows and each mesh becomes narrower and narrower in the direction of pushing. So a metabolic field with flattened cells is termed a contusion field and they develop wherever biomechanical compression is encountered. So the coverings of the spinal cord and young cartilage cells are examples of contusion fields. Mm -hmm. Then there's distusion fields, which is the opposite. It's pushing two, like pushing two lattices apart. Yeah. The metabolic field in which cartilage is exerts a pushing function is called a distusion field. This is like a piston function. Mm -hmm. yep. So then the last one we'll talk about tonight is retention fields. And this could be example uh, example by two people pulling on a strong cord so that it becomes taut. Tensed inner tissue like this arises in retention fields. So the developing heel cushion is our example here. So how do our heels develop so functionally that they serve to cushion the pressure generated during our stepping and our jumping? We're not gonna go into my, the minute details because that's kind of boring. <laughs> we'll just say that the entire or kind of long <laughs> when they're trying to explain it all. So we'll just say that the entire heel cushion can be compared to the pneumatic principle of a car tire. As it's inflated, it's pressed more firmly to the wheel. So as far as the distribution of tension is concerned, the heel cushion is no more stressed by the voluntary act of stepping on it than it is in the embryo by the retention field. So it's, it's that the retention field is what gives us our heel cushion. It's not the fact that we need to step on it again. <laughs> it's like our body parts were made just because they were made. They weren't made for us. <laughs> you know what we, it's like for us to live. You know what I mean? Do you understand what I'm saying? We get this egoic thing that goes, well, I need a finger. So I was given fingers. No, you were just, you, that's just part of the development. <laughs> it's not because you need it. <laughs> yeah. um, during embryonic development, the growth of the skin causes the heel cushion to be pushed against the heel bone. But in, when we step down on it, the reverse happens. The heel bone thrusts into the heel cushion. And this is significant because there's a lot of processes in the embryo that are the exact reverse of what their function is in the adult. So in the embryo, the uh, heel cushion is caused to be pressed against the heel bone, but when we step on it, the heel bone pushes into the cushion. So direct opposite effect. Mm -hmm. Stretch tissue in a retention field functions as a restraining apparatus. All tendons, ligaments, and joint capsules are examples of stretch tissue. Another example of the, is the connective tissue sheath of our blood vessels. And also the central zone of the embryonic diaphragm arising where the growing heart and enlarging liver are moving so close together that the intervening connective tissue is compressed while sim simultaneously being pulled out. At its edges. So that's how the diaphragm forms. It's being compressed and it's being pulled out. From the viewpoint of developmental kinetics, the fact that ligaments and ten tendons function subsequently as restraining structures is a result of their being stretched while being formed. The more powerful the retention field in the embryo, the more collagen will be attracted to the stretch cells and the more stretch resistant will become that tendon or ligament. This again is a frequently occurring thing we see, the reversal between embryonic growth function and the resulting adult function. 
and there's four more fields, but I figured we'd stop here tonight because that's quite a bit of information. That's a whole load of information and something to go through again. So how many fields are there in total? Eight. Eight. Which is why I, why I told you I want to start looking at the Bagua more because there's eight. There's eight forces in the Bagua, right? And that's why I wanted you to also watch that, that video of uh, pattern formation by Jeff Lawton. Um, because if you caught the point where he said between two external media, so that's where reading about these fields got me thinking about Don, Don Oscar Miro Quesada talking about the descent of energy from heaven into us and how it comes through planets and then Apus, which is part of the Bagua, that's where I was like, feels, 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 feels in the Bagua and the descent of energy from heaven, this just makes too much sense here. So somehow we're going to connect these. And, and today you covered how many of these fields? Only four. four. Wow. Only four. Yeah. So this is this is amazing. So this takes us into the third part of the ontogenic basis of view. Yeah. We are going to continue describing these, these fields and and maybe more surprises will come because there's already so many surprises, like so much to take in from from the information you're sharing. And it's something so very, very lost and it's like, what? How, yeah. how can we all be living in, 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 in the absence of this information, right? Well, that's why I felt it was so important to, to talk about this because it's it was like really mind blowing. And, and the it's cru crucial because you'll find, you know, I, 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 I've observed that you, you'll find uh, lots of, shamans or wise people or, or, or even gurus or whatever that apparently in the, in the with wise intentions will try to bring together their their knowledge of the divine and somehow integrate it or accept the the knowledge of science right and but then we're not realizing that much of that knowledge of science is not science and it's not knowledge. It's, it's a kind of like a, to me, it's a dogmatic construction. Yeah. That attempts at explaining something, but doesn't really fully explain something. And well, because so it's, guys, it's all powered by money, Julian, it's all powered by money. So it's all powered by what the, the company that's giving the money to the researcher wants found out. That's why, that's why. Yeah. So, we so, can't so these, trust the science because you got to follow the money. Where's the money for this science coming from? So that, so that's what, what I would tell any, any of these wise people or, you know, Hey, get, get your science straight. Um, and, and there's no other path than what you're doing, which is learn it yourself. Start studying, start learning, start researching, start thinking, because that's another thing. You wouldn't I have gotten asking you know, questions. You wouldn't I have found those questions. you wouldn't have found those books. You wouldn't have gotten to where you are if you weren't if, if you didn't develop the ability to think by yourself to really like to, to, to be given something and, and have this ability of noticing there's something wrong with with this information you're giving you're given. So uh, that's where you go out and try to find what's the right information, what's what's really going on here. But we, but if you don't have that ability, I mean lots of people even if apparently they're really smart or intellectuals, they don't have that ability. They really can't think by themselves. They really, they're just reproducing something they were given. 
given. Yeah. Um, so this, um, so yeah, th this is this is really important. I, uh, I feel it's something that should be spread out. But then, I, I, yesterday I was I was watching the. I, I got really um, interested in this in this um, pattern video. So I started watching more videos, and um, and I got to this one video, but with. Um, What's his name? The Morphic Fields guy, the uh, Rupert Sheldrake. That he 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 did a at once he did a TED talk where he that, that was about the dogmas of science. And that TED talk was censored. <laughs> it was taken out. <laughs> um so yeah, we 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 are locked into this almost like you can't find out what what the reality is you're you're you know but then it it it's there it's the real reality is there it's you can study it this guy probably got into watching um the embryo and without those molds of the dogmas of science yeah. take those molds out and start watching things again, start studying things again, everything. There's whole well, he's a, new revelations that come. He was an embryologist, he died. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting that he, um, that he challenged DNA, he challenged everything. I mean, he and he makes no bones about many, many times in here. He he calls out science and says it's just incorrect to say that what science says, right? And that that's something I get to all the time when I'm because I'm always interested in learning about anything that scientific. Of, I mean, uh, physics, earth sciences, and and I always have. Just, just this ability to doubt and then to kind of into be have the intuition to feel that something that is being explained to you has some incorrection in it or something wrong you know and, and you don't know what it is you can't explain it but you have that kind of kind of like intuitive intelligence that you can only get when you start connecting yourself back with, with the earth and, and, and with, and, and that means deconnecting from a paradigm that's all around the money. Because if you stay there, you're, you're, I mean, you, you don't ever connect really to the earth, kind of just in this virtual world. And so, that that's that's why it's crucial to have this these conversations and um, share it with folks and and I I ask them please uh, share this video please um, you know understand that since since the money since we are not flowing with the money and the money is not going to be flowing with us in, in the sense of um, you know the the system is not looking to to clear this out and by any means because it wants to keep keep it uh unknown it wants to keep it uh seen as something uh pseudoscientific right so th this is this is what i mean we're not gonna have you're not gonna see this in a big show you're not gonna see this in a big channel you're not gonna see this ever in in in, in and what you would expect, right? So that's what you, people need to, to, to support this. People need to, to and get involved and, and stop um, playing around in the virtual world. Let's get out of the virtual world. Let's, let's go into the reality. Let's, let's put our feet on the ground and let's find yeah. more people that, that are willing to do that, to, to put their feet on the ground, stop believing in fairy tales. <laughs> and so much just the flat earths. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, um, 
the big planets, Jupiter and not Jupiter, yeah, Jupiter and Saturn, they're all, they're coming north of the ecliptic. They spent the last 13 years below, below the ecliptic in the down under regions orbiting. Um, okay. That's significant. Which, yes, because over the next 13 years, as they come above the ecliptic, all these secrets that have been kept from us will be revealed. Yeah. So that's amazing. So let's 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 set up that invitation for more secrets to be revealed. In Aini Absolutely. Living and Aloha Aini Living, Aloha Aini Dao Living uh, channel. YouTube uh, website, alohaainiliving.com with only one A between Aloha and Aini. And, um, and please connect with us. Please help us out. Please be part of, of the revelation. And I guess that, with that we could end the Be part of walking away from the breaking down system. And that, yeah, that's the other argument. Big one, heavy one. Take a look at the future. <laughs> Where are you going? You don't want to be staying where you are. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. So. Sure. So, yeah. So on that note, we'll end the live stream and next week we'll do the ontogenic basis of you number three. We'll finish up with the fields and do a little bit more. Um, he has a second book that I'm going to be ordering about the fields. So hopefully we'll find out more about the fields. But right now, all I can say that we know is this is part of the, the matrix, the womb of the divine, the, the, the womb of love, the biological force of love that created us all. Mm -hmm. And this knowledge has to be, we are part of the, how it's coming to to be understood. Yeah. We're in the breaking yeah. edge of covering. Yeah. So. And you can be too. Yeah. <laughs> <And one more. laughs> yeah. So join us next time. And thank you, Ingrid. And thank you, everyone.